So welcome everybody to this latest video on 162 Matt and in this video we'll be going over the AQA GCSE November 2017 Higher Paper 1 which is a non-calculus paper. Now we'll include a copy of a link to the paper so you can have an attempt at it if you've not done so already before watching this video and going through the answers and I'll also include the grade boundaries that once you've tallied up your scores you can see what grade you've attained by completing this paper. So let's get started on this AQA November 2017 Higher Paper 1 which is a non-calculus paper. So looking at question one, it says work out what 2 to the power of 6 plus 6 squared actually is and square rooted. So 2 to the power of 6 is going to be 64. 6 squared is 36. And if we square root that, we get square root of 100, which is 10. Then for question two, 800 million in standard form. Well, 800 is 8 times 10 to the power 2. And a million is 10 to the power 6. So here we add the powers of 10. So that becomes 8 times 10 to the power of 8. For question three, it says circle the expression that is equivalent to 4a to the power 5 squared. So we've got 4a to the power 5 times 4a to the power 5. 4 times 4 is 16. And 8 to the power 5 times 8 to the power 5 is a to the power of 10, which gives us our first option. So for question 4, it says y equals 10 over x. If the value of x doubles, what happens to the value of y? Well, if that doubles, then basically it's going to be divided by 2. Then for question 5, a, it's a case of dots, so a difference of two squares, in which then we set up our two brackets. What do you have to square to get x squared? x. What do you have to square to get 100? 10. 1's a plus, 1's a minus, and it doesn't matter what order you put those brackets. Then for question 5b, it says solve 7x plus 6 is greater than 1 plus 2x for two marks. So for one mark, what you want to do is group all the x's together. So we get 5x plus 6 is greater than 1. Then 5x plus, or not plus, and we take the 6 over. So then that becomes minus 5, and then we divide by 5 giving us a final answer of x is greater than minus 1, or you could write your answer as minus 1 is less than x. So any of those two answers would be absolutely fine. Then moving on to question 6, it says work out the value of root 3 squared plus uh, times root 2 squared. So root 3 squared is root 9, times root 2 squared, which is root 4, and root 9 is 3, root 4 is 2, so it's 3 times 2, which is 6. For question 7, it says here is a quarter circle with a radius of 6. Write down the area of the quarter circle, giving your answer in terms of pi. So here the area of a full circle is pi r squared. And as it's a quarter, we divide that by 4. So completing that formula, we get 6 squared times pi over 4, which is 36 pi divided by 4. And 36 divided by 4 is 9 pi. And where the two marks come from is basically one mark for writing down the formula and then one mark for the correct answer. And with question eight, it says three whole numbers, each rounded to the nearest 10. The sum of the rounded numbers is 70. Work out the maximum possible sum of the three numbers. Now for this, when you are rounding to the nearest integer, then your range will, the number will start with a five and will go up and end in a four. So that means that these three numbers, the maximum number they can be, uh, is gonna be ended up in as a four. So that means then we've got three numbers. That's gonna be plus four, that's gonna be plus four, and that's gonna be plus four, giving us an extra 12. Now, if these numbers rounded add up to 70, the maximum they could add up to the unrounded could be another 12, giving us an answer of 82. I was going to write 84 there, but it's 82. And where the one mark would come from is evidence that you've got plus 12, then adding 12 to the 70 gives us 82. Then for question 9, it says circle the expression for the range of n consecutive integers, and that's simply going to be n minus 1. That, for all I would suggest is that you just, in your head, think of some consecutive numbers like a different list, work out the range, and then hopefully you'll spot a pattern of what that actually is, where n is the number of numbers. Moving on to question 10, it says three identical isosceles triangles are joined to make a trapezium. Each triangle has a base B centimetres and a perpendicular height of H. Work out an expression in terms of B and H, the area of the trapezium. Give your answer in its simplest form. Now, when working out the area of a trapezium, you need to know what this length here is, what this length here is, and what the height is. So here my A is 
the top one. B is going to be, well, it's going to be two lots of B. So here, looking at the area, it's going to be B plus 2B multiplied by H all divided by 2. So simplifying the brackets, I get 3BH divided by 2, and that there is my final answer. So here we get 3BH over 2. So moving on to the next question, it says diagram shows the same trapezium and it says B to S is in the ratio of 2 to 3. So here what we need to do is we need to work out and we need to write an expression for the perimeter of the trapezium in terms of B. So what I need to do first is convert S in terms of B. So looking at this ratio here, I've got B over S is going to be equal to 2 over 3. And I want to make S the subject. So I can cross multiply, so it gives me 3b equals 2s, so 3b divided by 2 equals s, or 1.5b equals s. So this, I can scrap and call that 1.5b. This I know is b, this I know is b, and this is going to be the same as the other side, so it's 1.5b. So that means that the perimeter then is going to be b plus 1.5b plus b plus b plus 1.5b giving me a total perimeter of 6b. Now let's just write that. Where you'd get the one mark is recognizing that s is equal to 1.5b and then one mark for 6b. Then moving on to our next question, question 11, it says four candidates in election were a, b, c and d. The pie chart shows the proportion of the uh, votes for each candidate. Work out the probability that a person who voted, chosen at random, voted for C. Now, we don't know what the total amount of people who voted for. So what we're going to do is we're just going to assume that the total number of voters is 360 because that's the only information that we know from this pie chart, which is that angles in a pie chart total up to 360. So what I need to do first is add up all of those angles. So I've got 90 plus X plus 2X plus 10 plus 2X all add up to 360. Now, if I simplify the left hand side, I get 5x plus 100 equals 360. And so 5x equals 260. And then x equals 260 divided by 5, which is 52. Now, for candidate C, the angle is 2x plus 10. So 2x plus 10. So here I've got 2 times 52 plus 10 so 2 times 52 is 104 plus 10 gives me an answer of 114 now the question is asking what's the probability well it's going to be 114 divided by 360 or we can simplify that as 19 over 60 so any of those two fractions would be fine for the four marks now i would say that you would get probably two marks for working out that x equals 52 one mark for 145, 114 and one mark for your final answer. Then for question 12, it says use approximations to one sig fig to estimate the value of. So for this, for three marks, I would say that you'd probably lose a mark for, we would gain a mark definitely for rounding all the numbers up to one sig fig. So you should have something that looks like this. Then we're looking at 0 0.5 times 1600 all divided by 10. So that gives me 800 divided by 10, giving me a final answer of 80. So I would say one mark for that, one mark for that, and one mark for your final answer. Then moving on to question 13, it says that x to y is in the ratio of 7 to 4, and x plus y equals 88. Work out the value of x minus y. So taking this first, what we get is we get x over y equals 7 over 4. And if we cross multiply, we get 4x equals 7y. Or we get that um, x equals 7y over 4. And I'm just going to pull a little bubble around that. So from this, what we then do is substitute it into this formula. So I know that rather than using x, I'm going to use 7y over 4. So 7y over 4 plus y equals 88. Then if I get a common denominator in terms of 7y over 4 plus 4y over 4 equals 88, I then get 11y over 4 equals 88. And then 11y equals 4 times 88, which is 352, giving me a y value of 32. 
Now if y equals 32, so then using x plus y equals 88, I get x plus 32 equals 88. So x equals 56. And then taking away those two numbers, 56 minus 32 gives me a final answer of 24. Now I've probably gone the really long way of going about this, but I would say where you'd get the marks is one mark for getting that y equals 32, one mark for y, x equals 56, and one mark for your final answer. Then for question 14, it says two congruent reg regular polygons are joined together. Uh, and we've got this angle here, which is 60. The work out the number of sides from each polygon. So here, to work out the number of sides, what we need to do is use the formula of 360 divided by the exterior angle. Now, what we need to appreciate that 60 degrees is combines two exterior angles, which is 30. So from one polygon, we've got 360 divided by 30. Cancel the zeros. 36 divided by 3 gives me an answer of 12. Now for the three marks, I'd say one mark definitely for the 12, one mark for recognizing that you've got 30 degrees and one mark for the use of the formula. Then looking at question 15, it says that a meal deal, choose one sandwich, one drink and one snack. There are seven different uh, sandwiches, five different drinks and three different snacks. How many different meal deal combinations are there? So for this, what we need to do is simply multiply the number of options from each other. So seven times five times three, which gives me an answer of 105 and you get one mark for those two. And then for question 15b, it says two sandwiches have cheese in them, three drinks are fizzy, Eva picks a meal deal at random, write down the probability that a sandwich has cheese in it and a drink is fizzy. Give your answer as a fraction. So here we've got two out of seven sandwiches and we've got three out of five drink options. So I would say you get one mark for that and then we get six over 35 that can't be simplified, so that there is my final answer. Then with question 16, it says water is poured into a tank. The graph shows the number of litres of water in the tank. How much water is poured into the tank each minute? So if we just work out one point, so for example, let's go for 4 and 60, because we know that's definitely a point there. So we get 60 litres in 4 minutes. And if we divide both numbers by 4, we get 15 litres equals one minute and so our option is 15 liters then with question 17 it says a and b are solid shape similar solids alex says that the volume of b is doubled uh, double the volume of a because the length of b is double in length of a so is he correct to the box and the question here we need to tick is no and the reason for that is if the length scale factor is k or another in this case two then the volume oh don't know what happened there then the volume scale factor will be k cubed so therefore giving it eight not double the next question then says circle the two roots of 2x plus 3 5x minus 2 equals 0 where well, it's already been factorized so here one root is going to be where we solve this the other root is going to be where we solve this so this gives me 2x minus 3, x equals minus 3 over 2, which is our first option. And then with this one, we get 5x equals 2, x equals 2 over 5, which is our third option. Then with question 19, it says the diagram shows a triangle and a trapezium prove that A equals B. So for this one, what we need to do is uh, that we just need to look at angle fact. So one angle fact is using all of these so we know that a plus 65 plus c plus 115 equals 360 and the reason for that is angles around a point equals 360 so simplifying all of this we get a plus c equals uh, and it's going to be 180 and so let's just put a little box around that now we also can see that as we've got a trapezium, that A and B are supplementary angles or co-interior. So A plus B equals 180. And the reason for that is either you can say that they're supplementary or co-interior. 
and here is our another option so now what i need to do is i can see that i've got a c in both but we need to get rid of the c so if i just rearrange this equation in blue so i get c equals and it's going to be 180 minus b and what i'm going to do is i'm going to substitute this equation here into that c there so what i've got is i've got a plus and then it's going to be 180 minus b equals 180. now getting rid of the brackets i get this and then taking the 180 over i get a minus b equals zero and then taking the b over the other side i get a equals b now where the three marks come from i would say and i'm just getting a decent color i would say that you get one mark for recognizing that all those angles around a point add up to 180 and simplify one mark for recognizing that c plus b is supplementary and they add up to 180 and then obviously going through the steps of getting a equals b then with question 20 it says in one month the number of hours of exercise taken by 10 people are and then we've got loaded numbers which are which is the appropriate average to use in this situation tick the box so the most appropriate one would be the median and then it says give one reason for each of the other two averages as to why they're not appropriate well for the mean the fact that we've got an extremely high number so for the mean i don't know why i've put a little line there so let me just get rid of it so for the mean 82 will distort the calculation and basically it's h2 is an outlier so something along those lines would be absolutely fine and then for the mode well there is no mode there's no number that appears more than one and even then out of 10 numbers and you only have a repeat of two i would say it's not really applicable now we're looking at question 21 so it says a and b and c are points on the axis as shown the area of the triangle abc is 25 uh, square units work out the possible coordinates of a b and c so what we've got here is what we've got a triangle and we've got the height and we've got the base and we know that b times h divided by 2 equals 28 so b h is going to equal 56 so what i need to do is i need to find two numbers that multiply together to give me 56 now there are loads of different numbers you could have decimals you could have uh, any any combination that multiplies to give you 56 so i would say the most common examples would be eight and seven so let's imagine that this length here is eight and this length here is going to be seven now from this if we know that the uh, length of o to c is going to be seven then this coordinate here is going to be seven zero that's that's set in stone. so i could go down and just write seven zero and that is not going to be a problem now for the next one this length here has got to be a now one thing i recognize is that a has got to be positive and b has got to be negative but the difference between those two numbers has got to be eight so i could have any sort of arrangement of uh, let's say for four and minus four and that would be absolutely fine so here we've got four actually it's going to be on the other side so it's going to be four here and minus four here and those two ordinates are going to be zero so basically these two numbers have got to have a difference of eight and this number multiplied by those two other let's let me just i like that in pink so this actually not pink because that's going to be even more confusing so let me just get rid of those uh highlighting and let's go for lilac so the lilac number multiplied by the sum of the two yellow numbers have got to add, multiply to give you 56 for this to be true so moving on to question 22 it says here is some information about miles per gallon of 60 cars and the question is asking us to draw a community frequency diagram so first things first let's calculate our community frequency values so you should have 6 22 50 and 60. now once you've calculated your community frequency values the next thing for us to do is then plot it now if you can see in the table we've got two blank sort of rows or columns i should say and we only really need to one so you don't don't feel like you have to complete the one that you don't use or if you want to use two i can only really assume that they've given you another one just so that you know what your x 
coordinate values are going to be on your x-axis now for this when you're plotting a community of frequency value you always want to plot the upper values so it's always the upper bounds so I can only really assume that what they made what you could use is use your community of frequency values there and then your upper bounds in this first column in which it's going to be 50 60 70 80 and uh, I've done that wrong so that should be I don't know why I put a number in the first column so here we should have 50 60 70 and 80 and then here if I wrote 6 22 50 and 60 so again if you wanted to you could do that or you could just fill in one of the columns of the community frequency values and that will be absolutely fine so now let's plot the value so again our lower value of the first group is at 40 so that's always going to be at zero so it's always important that you know recognize that where it starts so there it's at 40 zero the next coordinate is at 56 so here we go 50 across and then six up so that's going to be there and then the next value is at 70 and 50 oh no sorry 60 and 22 so at 60 22 is here then we've got 70 and 50 so 70 and 50 that should be a rather easy plot and then our last one is at 80 and 60 so 80 60 which is there now they've all they've written in the question is to draw a community frequency graph they've not asked for a community frequency polygon so what we need to try and do is use a curve for this and you again we're using a curve probably because we have got community data so here what we want to try and do is the best of your ability is now join those points up with a smooth curve now again yours should be a lot more accurate as you're going to be doing yours on paper but let's just see how accurate i can go and there you go and again what you want to try and do is try and have a continuous curve rather than ones with bumps and stuff we definitely what you don't want to do is any point of your curve do you want to be going down so you don't imagine you're going the curve is a hill under no circumstances should there be anywhere where you're going downhill so you always want to be going up you can go flat just never going down so moving on to question 22b it then says use the graph to work out the interquartile range now for this if i just have the graph here so the interquartile range is equal to the upper quartile minus the lower quarter so i need to work out what these two values here are now the maximum frequency as you can see from the table is going to be our top one so it's going to be 60 so the max or the total frequency is 60 so to find the lower quartile what I need to do is do 60 divided by 4 because I want the first quarter which is 15 so then from this what I'm then going to do is find 15 on the y-axis and then which is in between the 10 and the 20 and again just going to go across and then whatever number this is now again there is always going to be a range of what your lower quartile value should actually be but it's going to be always based on the curve that you have drawn so again if, if your numbers are different to mine because your curve is a lot more accurate hopefully going to be a little bit more accurate than mine then don't worry but i'll just give you a like a ballpark sort of figure so as soon as it hits the curve you then project down and again try and keep those lines as straight horizontal and vertical as possible using a ruler but i made that out to be roughly maybe about 57 so i'm just going to write that is roughly 57. then to work out the upper quartile well that's going to be three quarters so i'm going to do three quarters times 60. well three times 60 is 180 so remember this is non-calculator or 60 divided by 4 is 15 times 3 is 45 so then I want to find 45 so let me just highlight that with a different color let's use lighter lilac so here's 45 so I'm then gonna kind of draw a horizontal line again making sure that that is straight so that's my lower quartile that's my lower quartile let's get that pan back up and so when it hits the curve I make it out to be around about there and then going a straight vertical line going down I made that to be 68 so then once I've worked out those two values to then work out the interquartile range it's going to be 68 minus 57 
which I make out to be 11. So all I really do is scroll down here and just write down 11. Then moving on to question 23. So this involves completing the square. It says the equation of the curve is y equals, and in brackets, x plus 3, all squared plus 5, circle the coordinates of the turning point. Now, for the turning point, the x-ordinate is the value of x that makes the bracket equal to 0. And, and the y-ordinate is always the number outside the bracket. So here to make the bracket equal to 0, x must equal minus 3. And the number outside the bracket is plus 5. So what we're looking for is minus 3, 5, which is our fourth option. So looking at question 24, it says here is a cyclic quadrilateral and it says x to y is in the ratio of 5 to 7. Work out the size of angle W. So here we've got, we know that, let's have a look at some of the rules. We know using the ratio that I've been given. So to find W, I need to work out what x is first. So let's have a look and see how we go about doing that. So here we've got x to y equals 5 to 7. So just like before, we can write this as a fraction. And then we cross multiply to get 7x equals 5y. And I'm just going to pull a little box around that. Now another equation I can work out using x and y's is that opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180. So x plus y equals 180. So if I rearrange this, what I get is I get 7x minus 5y equals 0. And then what I then want to do is use simultaneous equations to solve uh, find out what x and well particularly x and x and y is so here i've got 7x minus 5y equals 0 and x plus y equals 180 now if i multiply this equation by 5 i get 5x plus 5y equals 180 times 5 is 900 then if i write the second equation again equals 0 and I take away the two equations I end up with minus 2x equals 900 and oh I need to add them sorry so then that's going to be 12x equals 900 so from this I get x equals 75 degrees now I don't necessarily need to work out y so using then these two angles so x plus 20 plus w equals 180 I know that x equals 75, so 75 plus 20 plus w equals 180. 95 plus w equals 180, so w equals 85 degrees, and there is my final answer. Then for question 25, it says 15 machines are work at the same rate. Together, the 15 machines can compete, complete an order in eight hours. Three of the machines break down after working six hours. The other machines carry on working until the order is complete. In total, how many hours did each of the other machines work? So let's first of all work out what the total number of hours is gonna be for the job. So that's gonna be 15 times eight which gives me an answer of 120 hours. So we need 120 hours. One machine needs to be running uh, for 120 hours to complete this job. So for this, we get 120 minus, now six of the machines, uh, three of the machines only work for three hours. So then what we've got is then we've got 120, take away 18, gives me 102 hours, four. And we've got uh, 12 machines. So, what we then do is 102 divided by 12 and we can do that a number of ways so we can simplify it so we get 51 over 6 so then i've got 6 over 51 how many sixes go into there that's going to be zero don't know why i've put a decimal point there so let's get rid of that decimal point and then we carry the five that then becomes eight there's the zero there's the decimal point and then that becomes five so it's going to be 8.5 hours 
Then for question 26a, it says 0.7 recurring is 7 over 9. Use the facts to show that 0.07 recurring equals 7 over 90. So here we get that 0.7 divided by 10 gives me 0.07 recurring. Now if I convert both these as fractions, so that's 7 over 9, divided by 10, which is 10 over 1, and then I can then, using my knowledge of dividing fractions, I flip the second fraction, which I've not done, and it then turns to a times, and that gives me 7 over 90, which is what they wanted me to show. Then for question 26b, it says, uh, for using part A or otherwise convert 0.27 recurring into a fraction. So using part A, what we get is we get that 0.27 recurring equals, and it's going to be 0.2 plus 0.07 recurring. This as a fraction is 2 over 10 plus, and then it's 7 over 90. And then if I get a common denominator, times that the bottom one by 9 so I get 18 over 90 plus 7 over 90 gives me an answer of 18 plus 7 which is 25 over 90 simplify that as a fraction and which I need to do and I get 5 over 18 now if I wasn't doing it completely then if I make x equal to 0.27 recurring I then multiply that by 10, so I get 2.7 recurring, multiply it by 100, and I get 27.7 recurring. Then if I take away these two away from each other, I end up with minus 90x equals minus 25, so x equals minus 25 over 90, which is 25 over 90, which gives me the same answer of 5 over 18. Then moving on to question 27, it says that there are 11 pens in a box, three are black and three are red. Two pens are taken at random without replacement. Work out the probability that two pens are the same color. So first pen can either be black or red. And then my second pen could either be black or red, black or red. Now in terms of having the same color, well, I'm either gonna have red and red or black and black. So just simply writing down the formulas here, so we get 11 pens to start with, 11 are black, so we've got 8 over 11, and this is going to be 3 over 11. Then in the second pick, I'm always going to end up with one less. So I've only got 10 left to pick. From the black, I've already selected one, so that's going to be 7, and I've still got 3 red pens left. If red pen is selected, I've still got all 8 black pens left, but I've only got one less red pen. So in terms of R and R, that's going to be 3 over 11 times 2 over 10 plus, and then black is going to be 8 over 11 times 7 over 10. Then if I simplify each of those, 3, three times 2 is 6, 11 times 10 is 110, 8 times, five, uh, eight times 7 is 56, and that's going to be 110. Give me a total of 62 over 110. And does that, that should simplify because they're both uh, even numbers. And that gives me an answer of 31 over 55. Then looking at question 28, it says that, uh, question 28 says, A, B and C are points in the circle. X squared plus Y squared equals 36. A is on the Y axis, B is on the X axis, M is the midpoint of AB, and COM is a straight line. Show that the coordinates A is 0, 6. Well, here we know that from this, that the radius R squared equals 36. So R is going to equal uh, square root of 36. It can't be negative, so R has got to be 6. And if the radius is 6, so we know that OA equals the radius. So the distance between O to A equals 6 and that's why the coordinate is 0, ooh, zero 6. Now work out B, well that's going to be virtually the same so that's going to be 6, 0 just with the other way around. Now the next question then says show that the equation of the straight line passing through COM is Y equals X. Now for this one what we need to do first is show 
work out the gradient of AB. So the gradient of AB is going to be 6 minus 0 over 0 minus 6, which is minus 1, which makes sense. Now, O to M is the midpoint, so that means that this is going to be perpendicular. So therefore, the gradient of OM is going to be minus 1 over minus 1, which is positive 1. So then using the equation of a line, y equals mx plus c, we know that the coordinate it passes through is 0, 0. So that's my x, that's my y, and we know that m equals 1. So I get 0 equals 1x plus uh, c. So c equals, actually that's going to be x is 0, so that's going to be 0. So c equals 0, so therefore the equation of the line is y equals x. Then the next part then says work out the coordinates of C, give your answers in third form. So if I go back to this question, the diagram here, now what I want to do is first, let me just get rid of all of this, just so that we are creating a bit of space. So from this, what we know is, we know that this length here is six, because we already know that. So now we know that this, if we just call those two sides X, I know that using Pythagoras, that x squared plus x squared equals 6 squared. So 2x squared equals 36. So x squared equals 18. So x equals the square root of 18. So that's what this length here is going to be. Now that length there is at root 18. And that length there is also going to be at root 18. So for this, what we then know that this length C is going to be therefore at that distance there is going to be minus root 18 and this distance here is going to be minus root 18 as well. So here that we've then got our coordinates, which is, um, just move that down here. So we can either write the answer as minus root 18 minus root 18, or you can write it in a simplified third as minus 3 root 2 minus 3, oh, again, do not know what's happened there, uh, minus 3 root 2. Then moving on to question 29, it says here is a sketch of y equals sine x for the range of minus 360 to 360, and what we need to do is to state the values or coordinates of p and q. So labeling this up we know that the limits on the y-axis is minus 1 to 1 and we know that it's got intervals of 90 and 360 so that's at minus 90 that's at minus 180 that's at minus 270 and that's at minus 360 so here p is going to have a coordinate of and it's going to be 0 or 180 and 0 and q is going to have a coordinate of minus 270 and 1. Then moving on to question 30, A, it says work out the value of 81 to the power of a quarter, minus a quarter. Well, then that becomes, so again, when you've got the fractional power, B is the power and C is the root, and the negative basically means the reciprocal. So what this then turns into is 1 over 81 to the power of a quarter which then becomes one over the quart root of 81 to the power of one, and that then becomes a third. Now for question 30b, what we need to do, it says write 16 times eight to the power of two x as a power of two in terms of x. Well, for this, what we need to do is convert 16 and eight as powers of two. So 16 is two to the power of four, and eight is two to the power of three. So if I substitute those in, I get two to the power of four times two to the power of three to the power of two x. Now here, I, the first one's doing absolutely nothing, whereas here where I've got brackets, I multiply the two powers. So that gives me two to the power of six x. And then what do we do to the powers when we multiply them? Well, we add them. So then the answer then is two to the power of four plus six x or 2 to the power of 6x plus 4, whichever floats your boat. And there is a final answer and the end of this paper. Now, I will put the, mark the um, 
grade boundaries in the description below to see that once you've marked your paper you can then see what grade you've attained on this individual paper from grades nine to three.